The RTX 5090 is a substantial increase in performance over the 4090, but coming in at $1999 versus $1599, or a 25% increase in price, as well as sucking down an insane 575 watts, is it really worth purchasing the RTX 5090 to get that performance increase, or are GPUs just getting too expensive and drawing too much power? Well, today let's find out by taking a look at a 10 game average at 4K using both the native resolution and DLSS at stock settings, as well as investigating the overclocked performance versus an RTX 4090 to determine if the RTX 5090 is worth refinancing your home and selling your kidney for. Oh, and before we get into the review, I do want to thank NVIDIA for sending over a permanent RTX 5090 Founders Edition sample for this video. However, no talking points were dictated, no results have been altered, and my opinions are my own. If I feel like the 5090 isn't worth buying, I'll tell ya. But in any case, before we get into the games, I do want to go over a couple of new features that the RTX 5090 brings that don't directly relate to performance, but could be some real nice to haves you might want to consider when looking at the 5090 or other RTX 50 series cards. Now, the first thing and quite possibly the most important feature that RTX 50 brings is DisplayPort 2.1. Now, this is important because with DisplayPort 2.1, you can finally drive a full 4K 240 Hertz HDR image on these brand new OLED monitors without having to use display stream compression as long as they also use DisplayPort 2.1, which many coming out this year will have that. Also, Nvidia has actually redesigned the cooler in a number of ways to allow it to finally get down to a two slot design. And let me tell you, it is much, much smaller than the RTX 4090, meaning that, well, small form factor case enjoyers can well rejoice because it'll finally fit in your case and the thermals and acoustics are actually going to be pretty good overall. In fact, I saw some pretty respectable mid 70 degrees Celsius readings in an MATX case, which is actually pretty impressive. And although it was louder than the RTX 4090, it's certainly not going to sound like a jet engine. Although I am interested to see if AIB 5090s can improve upon that. Also, in terms of the physical design, another thing that's changed is that they've actually gone from the 12 volt high power to a new connector that's actually backwards compatible, but should be redesigned so that melting cables should be a thing of the past. With that out of the way, let's get into the test system and then into those games. So the test system I'll be using today is actually my personal computer, which comes with an overclocked 9800X 3D, 64 gigabytes of 6,000 megatransfer CL30 DDR5 memory, and an Asus X870 ITX motherboard. And the 10 games I'll be testing today will be Avatar, Frontiers of Pandora, Black Myth Wukong, Call of Duty Black Ops 6, Cyberpunk 2077, Dying Light 2, Fortnite, Horizon Zero Dawn Remastered, Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, Returnal, and the Talos Principle. So first starting off here with Black Myth Wukong 4K cinematic preset. And here you can see that the RTX 5090 is actually around 33% faster on average than the RTX 4090, but surprisingly is around 50% faster on the 1% lows. Now this is certainly an outlier, but this could partially be down to the much higher memory bandwidth, the roughly, I believe, 78% higher memory bandwidth that's on the RTX 5090. That coupled with the increase from 24 to 32 gigabytes of memory, as well as the massive increase in core count, all the way from 128 SMs on the 4090 to now 170 on the 5090. And yeah, not only is it going to have a lot more core performance, but that memory and memory bandwidth could help in some niche scenarios where possibly the RTX 4090's bandwidth wasn't quite enough to give as consistent of performance. But as I mentioned, I also did overclock the RTX 5090 and the results I got were a 270 megahertz overclock on the core and I got the memory to stably run at 31 gigabits per second up from the 28 gigabits per second. Now that increase actually extended the 1% low improvement to 56% and the average FPS to 38% on the RTX 5090 OC. And even when using DLSS, well, the 1% lows were 27% faster on the RTX 5090 and 28% faster on the average frame rate. Now going forward, I'm actually gonna go ahead and just talk about 5090 stock versus 4090 stock, then we'll go over the overclocked and DLSS results at the end. And I'll just be showing six of the nine games to kind of speed things up here, but let's move on. So the next game here is gonna be Cyberpunk 2077, 4K RT Overdrive. And here we got a 1% low improvement of 20% and an average frame rate improvement of 38% 
on the RTX 5090 versus the RTX 4090, and that's a pretty impressive result. Then next up we have Dying Light 2 4K high quality with RT on, and once again the 1% low saw a massive 47% increase in performance, and the average frame rate also improved by 44%, making the RTX 5090 much, much faster in this title. Then next up we have Fortnite DirectX 12 4K Epic with hardware ray tracing enabled, and here the 1% lows were 31% better on the RTX 5090 and 23% better for the average frame rate. Next up we have Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy 4K Ultra with ray tracing enabled, and the 1% lows were 34% higher, but the average frame rate was an incredible 41% increase. Next up we have Returnal 4K Epic settings in the 5090 here was 23% faster on the 1% lows and 28% faster on average. And taking a look at the 10 game average, well you can see here that the RTX 5090 was on average 29% faster on the 1% lows and 28% faster on average, making the RTX 5090 a pretty significant performance uplift, at least at 4K native over the RTX 4090, but what about the 5090 overclock? Well, on the averages, it was around 33% faster and around 38% faster on the 1% lows. And then taking a look at the DLSS results, the RTX 5090 was just 21% faster on the 1% lows and 24% faster on the average. As you can see, the RTX 5090 definitely seems to shine at those 4K native results and probably even more so at 5K as those higher resolutions are likely making more usage of that higher memory bandwidth extending the lead on the RTX 5090. So if you make heavy use of DLSS, well the RTX 5090 might not actually be as impressive as you were expecting. But one area where the RTX 5090 absolutely blew my mind was making use of the tensor cores. And more specifically here, I'm talking about using RTX HDR while using DLSS. And that's gonna be making quite a bit of use of those tensor cores in the GPU. And this unfortunately would kind of bring the RTX 4090 to its knees. In fact, taking a look here at a game where I tested this, the RTX 4090 got 94 FPS for the 1% low and 173 for the average frame rate in the finals on the Kyoto map while it was snowing at 4K DLSS performance with RTX HDR enabled. However, the RTX 5090 kicks it up enormously to 150 FPS on the 1% low and 221 on average. What that means is it's actually 28% faster on average than the RTX 4090, which is to be expected, but get this, the 1% low increases by 60 whopping percent. But now let's talk about the power scaling on the RTX 5090, because whether you wanna overclock or maybe undervolt your GPU, this might be actually some really useful information. So I went ahead and tested the RTX 5090 at 400 watts, 450, 500, 575, and then with some overclocked results. And what I found was, well, the RTX 5090 actually does scale pretty well up to roughly 500 watts. And then after 500 watts, well, it starts to kind of fall off in terms of the performance increases and gets very diminishing. Now at 400 watts, it got around 83 FPS and 2.18 gigahertz roughly for the clock speed. 450 jumped to 2.314 and got 88 FPS. And then at 500 watts to nearly 2.4 gigahertz and 91 FPS. And then finally at the stock 575 watts, it did reach just over 2.4 gigahertz and got 93 FPS on average. And then if you overclock it at 600 watts, you can reach nearly 2.67 gigahertz and get 99 FPS on average. Now, the interesting thing about this is that actually even just running at 450 watts and then overclocking the card, you get to around 2.525 gigahertz and reach 96 FPS, meaning that you're actually getting better than stock performance while drawing over 100 watts less power. And then if you bump it to 500 watts and do the same thing, well, you're effectively getting the maximum performance out of this card. There's very little difference between it at 500 with an OC and at 600 watts with an OC. So it seems like maybe voltage could be a problem here or something like that as currently it's locked out, but that's what I'm seeing right now. And in fact, I actually settled on around 525 watts at around 2.6 gigahertz as I felt like this would be a very stable result 
and would still allow me to extract the maximum performance out of the card while drawing 50 watts less power. But now let's talk about DLSS 4. This is the premier feature of the RTX 50 series. And how good is DLSS 4? Well, if you take a look at a chart, it looks really good. Wow, it's giving you an incredible seven times higher frame rate than running it at pure native. Now this is with frame generation as well as DLSS upscaling, but you get the idea. You can massively increase your performance on paper when you use all these settings. However, in practice, it comes with a lot of downsides. In fact, taking a look here at the latency of using these various different settings, you can see here just using DLSS upscaling, I did get in Cyberpunk 2077 around 31 milliseconds of total system latency, and then using two times frame generation, it jumped up to 36 then at three times jumped up to 39, and then at four times it jumped up to 40 milliseconds of total system latency. So yeah, you're getting 234 FPS, but the latency is actually substantially worse, making it not necessarily an ideal solution for I'd say probably the vast majority of games. Now there are some games I would run two times frame generation on and maybe one or two that I would run three or four times frame generation on if I had a very high refresh rate monitor. And it's cool that it comes with the RTX 50 series, but I don't see myself using frame generation in general all that often. And even if I do, it's probably gonna be two times as it has the lowest latency impact. But the more impressive feature that I'm really hyped about is actually the new DLSS transformer model. The new DLSS model is in theory able to not only reduce VRAM requirements, I believe, but also it it should be able to improve the image quality, especially in motion when using DLSS quite a bit. And in my testing, that's actually true. Now taking a look here at this scene of Cyberpunk 2077, you can see that with the older model, well, there's a lot of ghosting and just ugliness to the image when people are walking by, especially in the distance. But when we move to the new transformer model, it almost entirely resolves these problems. Now there is still a bit of ghosting if you look way off in the distance, but especially the closer details have been cleaned up massively. And this is just a huge win for DLSS that brings it that much closer to being a feature that I would just enable in every game flat out and never not use. I mean, we are getting dangerously close to native level type of image quality out of DLSS, especially in the quality mode. And if this continues to improve, DLSS is going to be an absolutely insane killer feature for the RTX 50 and any RTX card going forward, especially considering this should be coming to all RTX GPUs. In fact, I would already consider this to be a pretty killer feature of an NVIDIA GPU, and I think they're going to be substantially ahead of their competition with this new Transformer model. Though, to be honest with you, this deserves its own whole video, and I'll probably go ahead and do that. Let me know in the comments below if you'd like to see that. But now let's move on to another topic that, again, probably deserves an entire video that I'd like to do, and that's Reflex 2. Now, I've talked about this in the past, but Reflex 2 is insane. At CES, they showed me Reflex Off versus Reflex On, and it cut the latency in half, roughly. But Reflex 2 actually warps a not even totally complete image yet to your screen and then fills in the gaps. And it actually does it extremely, extremely well. I mean, I looked for problems with the screen and you can really not notice anything. I really doubt you'll be able to notice any artifacting or issues, especially in the finals where they are showing it. And it cut the latency in half yet again. It shaved about 10 milliseconds on the system they are using. Now, your mileage may vary based on your system, but another 10 millisecond reduction is a very substantial and real advantage for people who have this feature. So if you don't have, this is kind of crazy, but if you don't have an NVIDIA RTX card and you don't have access to Reflex 2, well, when this comes to the finals and as other games adopt it, you may actually be at a legitimate disadvantage to people who do have RTX cards. So overall, should you buy an RTX 5090? And that's a tough question because on the one hand, you do get 28% more performance, roughly give or take, and 33% more VRAM. But on the other hand, it comes in at a 25% higher price and 28% higher power drop. Not to mention that based on the reviews you watch, the performance may be a little bit less or a little bit more. So your results may vary. Who knows, maybe you'll only see a 20% improvement and in that case, it sounds even worse. But based on the games that I tested in this review, whether you're looking at DLSS results or native 4K performance, it looks 
like the RTX 4090 and the RTX 5090 at their MSRPs are giving you very, very similar price to performance. Some reviews may have it as worse, others may have it as better, but overall, I feel like this is a little bit disappointing to see after two whole years of waiting. But to be fair, well, Nvidia has no competition and the RTX 5090 is substantially faster. So the question of, is the RTX 5090 worth it, really comes down to what resolution you run and what games you play. I mean, if you're playing at 1440p using DLSS, well, it probably won't be worth it, especially if you already have an RTX 4090. But if you're playing at 4K native or make heavy use of tensor accelerated features, I would definitely say yes. I mean, in my case, I play a lot of the finals and I love HDR. So the RTX 5090 is more like a 60% performance boost for me a majority of the time since I'm playing that game a lot right now. So in that case, the price to performance is a huge improvement, but many other gamers may not make heavy use of features like RTX HDR, especially since the Nvidia app currently has a pretty substantial performance hit that Nvidia is working on, but might take them some time to resolve. And honestly, hopefully RTX HDR in general can also be reduced in terms of its performance cost, especially on older generation cards, as this performance hit on the 4090 seems a bit excessive. But this is why reviewing the RTX 5090 is so tough. For some people, it may be closer to a 20% upgrade, for others, 30%. In some niche scenarios, it might be more of a 60% improvement for you. And I suspect you will see a lot more variance in reviews this time, since it's so much more complex with all these new features. And for me, as cool as the new RTX 50 exclusive DLSS 4 is, I just don't see myself using it often, but that's yet another feature you'll have to decide for yourself if it's something you want, because that's yet another scenario where some may see it as worthless frame smoothing AI slop, whereas others might see it as doubling their motion clarity in a crucial new feature worth buying the RTX 50 series for to make the best use of their new 480 Hz or 500 Hz OLEDs. For me, the big selling features right now are RTX HDR, which runs much better on the 5090 at the moment, the new DLSS transformer option, which will be available for all RTX cards, and Reflex 2, which once again will be available for all RTX cards. So outside of the RTX 5090's higher performance and better AI capabilities, the RTX 50 series as a whole seems like an upgrade more for all GeForce RTX owners, as most of these features are available or will become available to all RTX cards. So in that sense, the 50 series may be one of the best generations, not because it's worth upgrading to, but because in developing it, Nvidia has retroactively improved all their graphics cards, which is great for Nvidia owners. But at the end of the day, I do have to give a hard answer. And as much as I don't like how expensive the RTX 5090 is, without any competition and a history of scalpers reselling flagship cards at $2,000 plus anyway, I can't really blame Nvidia for charging that much for the RTX 5090, and in my opinion, it does indeed bring a substantial generational upgrade in performance worth buying if you're an enthusiast PC gamer with deep pockets. I would even go out and buy myself an AIB RTX 5090 having already owned an RTX 4090. And if you are interested in picking one up, I'll have some affiliate links in the description below when it's actually available to purchase, but be warned, I've been told by a number of people that the supply for the 5090 is gonna be pretty thin on the ground for probably a good number of months until it finally starts to pick up. So your results on picking one up might also vary. Just please don't pick up one that's been flipped over on eBay and I really hope going forward that Nvidia has more competition in the high-end space because I'd like to see prices coming down, not continuing to go up. But hey, that's just what I think. Do you think that the RTX 5090 really is worth it, even for RTX 4090 owners, or do you feel like the price and the power is just getting too out of control and you're gonna be skipping the RTX 50 series? Let me know your guys' thoughts in the comments below, and of course, I'll see you in the next video.